we're going to be talking about flying to the moon. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Well, what the heck is it? Anyone have any ideas? Ah, excellent. You saw this show before. Anyway, sorry? Half an AGC? Half, and we're going to talk that. Anyway, uh, a, couple, uh, a couple little pointer notes and all the rest. Uh, I love it when people uh, bang out questions. The one thing I have a small problem with, again, feel free to jump in. Uh, if you have a conversation that starts with, oh, my dad's brother's father's sister's other third tier whatever relative working for an obscure contractor, worked with Apollo, and he had fun. And I was like, yeah. Oh, I just wanted to say that. Hold that till later. <laughs> We're on a tight schedule today. Uh, again, uh, I don't like running over. Obviously, we have people who come in after this. So, you know, I, I don't want to tie them up. If we have the uh, grand conversations, and I hope we do, We'll just step outside. We can sit anywhere. We'll go where, I don't know where you want to go, but we can talk all day. I don't have to be anywhere, and the dog's being walked by someone else. <laughs> so, flying to the moon. Cool. I have a cool job. Been doing it about a decade. Actually, I've been working for NASA for, oh, sorry, volunteering. I don't get a government paycheck. For about 30 years. If you want to know anything and everything about the Apollo missions, go and find the Apollo Lunar Surface and the Apollo Flight Journals. They're hung off the NASA webpage. Today we're having problems. Someone screwed up. They wiped out our CSS file on one of the websites. But you can go in directly to the missions. The main homepage is shot. But we sit down, get all the transcripts. Imagine doing OCR 30 years ago. Okay, 46s don't do it quick. Anyway, we get all the transcripts. We get a lot of smart people. And then we take the transcripts, we pull out all the technical files, we get people who are smart in various areas, and guess what? We now have every moment recorded, documented, and then we sit down with the flight crews and give them the final you know, uh, flight debriefing from hell. And they had all their commentary. The only people we didn't get were Al Shepard and Jim Irwin, because he's dead. Uh, or, well, but most of them are dead now. But it is the prime resource for NASA and for you guys. And it's the best thing ever. You want every manual, every checklist, I, you can get them. Then, about a decade ago, 15 years ago, I became a solar system ambassador. And boy, is that fun. Because. Sorry, folks, you're not going to get an astronaut for your kid's birthday. I know, you hear that combined. Oh. Well, everyone wants to know about NASA. That's why you're here. And so NASA's Education and Public Outreach Group uh, put together the ambassador program. So actually, we hit our 25-year anniversary. We get out to about 3 million people a year. There's 1,100 of us all over the country. Yeah, we can be going out with your daughters. Be afraid, or, or your sons. And we, we'll go all the way around that. It's a magnificent program. I give a lecture every month over at ISAC on various space topics. I do two, three, four lectures a month, you know, various places from Philly to New York. So honestly, it's a fantastic program. I don't get paid for it. And believe me, I'm not allowed to accept a nickel from anyone. Someone can buy me a cup of coffee, maybe. But the important thing is, I would say this is your tax dollars at work, but there's no tax dollars. This is a free, out of a goodness of our heart uh, program, and it is fabulous. But let's get on to this. Oh, quick, I'm Frank O'Brien, if you don't know this already. Um, what do you call, uh, I, I live about an hour away. I live in a great place. Everyone's hometown just has a wonderful little place to you know, say, oh, we're famous for this, that, and the other, right? You know, we can all, yeah, wherever we live, we can always find some great trivia that the Chamber of Commerce or someone's pushing out. Where I live, just up the street, right up the street from my house, is where the Martians invaded in 1938. <laughs> Top that. <laughs> anyway, again, we're on the clock. I'm going to talk fast. I apologize. You know, for me, talking slow is just one of those difficulties to begin with. 
Anyway, so let's get cranked up. Myth busting. That's a computer that took men to the moon. That's a beautiful thing, right? Mm -hmm. And everyone's metric today is, oh, wow, my watch, my phone, my microwave. It's got more power than this little box here. How many of you heard that? Just about everyone. How many believe it? Just about everyone. That's a lot of hooey. That's a lot of hooey. Question. This is a serious one. Again, I don't want to drag this out with a question and answer, but to yourselves, how do you define computer power? Powerful computers, Arr, bodily, strong like bull. Memory input connections per second. Good, good one. Memory's another one. IO capacity, storage space, et cetera, et cetera. We can go down all that list. In every instance, this one loses. Every single one. By the time we're done, you will see why I will argue it is as powerful as this. How do you define power? I drove here in a 12-year-old Honda uh, Fit. Love that car, 40 miles a gallon. Certified by law enforcement to go 88 miles an hour in a 65 zone. <laughs> Certified by law enforcement. Those are expensive tickets. Now, I think that's pretty powerful for a 12-year-old little Honda Fit. You know that crawler transporter that took the Saturn V and the SLS and the shuttles to the launch pad? That goes half a mile an hour. That gets literally feet to the gallon of fuel. I get 40 miles a gallon and certified 88 miles an hour in a 65 zone. What is powerful? I could drive rings around that thing. Of course, it's a small problem dragging 8 million pounds of rocket up an incline. Can't do that. What's powerful? Yeah, crawler's powerful. Let's see. <laughs> Out of a starting, uh, uh, from a, you know, a solid stop. Let's see who you know, gets to the end, of the, gets to the launch pad first. We are going to be going over all the stereotypical concepts of power, all that happy nonsense. And I think by the time you're do we're done, you're going to realize these two are closer than you might think. Anyway, getting to the moon. Now we're talking all this stuff being designed in 1960. Think of that. That's 60 something years ago. Yeah, we landed on the moon in 69, but all this stuff had to be developed and built before then. It's the middle of the Cold War. What the heck happens if those Ruskies are going to interfere with the flight? We want to make certain we can get from the Earth to the moon autonomously. Autonomous flight, let the guys do it all themselves. Also, we got to be pretty accurate. Tenth of a foot a second, velocity, yeah, well, uh, you got to be accurate in that. Also within a fraction of a mile. 1960s technology, you're trying to go a quarter million miles. You're going to need autopilots. Digital, that word did not exist in 1960. It didn't even exist until the early, uh, well, until the early 70s, and we got to build one. That's pretty tough. I got to have software to get me off the ground. I got to land on the moon. I have to get back home. Needless to say, you don't want it to break. Digital equipment, digital chips at the time. Want to guess what the mean time to failure in 1960 for a digital circuit was? It was about 12 hours. <laughs> and you got thousands of hours of testing and a two week flight to the moon and back and you got to make certain it don't break. Hmm, we have to fix these problems. Here's our topic. We're, we're talking about flying to the moon. We're going to be talking about the computer. Also, the inertial measurement unit. This is how you figure out where the heck you are, where you're going. And also optics, we're just going to talk that real quick. But those are the three components in flying to the moon. This is the computer. This is the flight version. 
This is over at ISEC. I had to steal it. Yes, I, I got all the permissions. This is the CPU. The second tray has the ROM, read-write memory, all the timing chips, interrupts, power, you know, the whole other stuff. We're lucky we just have the CPU. Quickie overview. We always hear it's a 16-bit processor. That's not quite true. All right, how many people really count parity? Not too many. Okay, so we got that. 1960 multi-program priority scheduled OS. It was another 10 years by the time we finally stopped doing single read in the cards. You have the computer to yourself and then you get your output and then you turn it over to the next guy. Multi-programming did not exist on a practical level in 1960. Oh, all those fancy little things I, I was talking about, flying to the moon, landing, coming home, you gotta squeeze that into six, uh, 36K words. Bytes weren't a thing. 15 bits of 36K words. Oh, and you get 2K of read-write. Now that is all the software. There were no secondary things like tape, certainly no disk. You had to squeeze all your code in there. I'm gonna ask all the, most of us are programmers or at least dabbled in it, all the rest. How tight is your code? <laughs> How good of a programmer are you? Come on, this is 60 something years ago. People were able to squeeze all that into 36K and 2K read write. Come on, guys. In order to squeeze all that in, we had horrible memory management issues. You had 12 bits of address, that'll get you 4K. I got 36K, I gotta do some evil, horrible. People were in therapy for years after this. <laughs> uh, doing memory bank, we'll just go over real quick with that. A word that was never used. I use it today because it's the best explanation. Oh, 36K? Squeeze into that five VMs. Five virtual machines. Actually, five in the Lunar Module, six in the Command Module. But yeah, all that and I have to implement VMs as well. What's a VM? It's an entirely different uh, architecture, probably, sometimes. Certainly isolated from the rest of the system. Basically what they did was uh, uh, what today would be recognized. And again, I'm stretching this, I know. What would be recognized as say like a Java uh, bytecode engine. Five of them running simultaneously. Multi-programmed virtual machines. And anyone who thinks that VMware is pretty slick ought to look at this ancestor. A measurement of power. I got a fancy dancy, no I don't, it's 20 years old. Uh, microwave. Its processor, by some people's accounts, is more powerful than the Apollo computer. What does it do? I type in a number, I hit start, zaps my leftover Chinese. A measurement of computing power is how many devices you can make and uh, do your magic with. This little box here controlled 150 systems. My microwave controls a magnetron and the keypad, maybe. Which is more powerful? 60 year old machine or, well, in my case, a 20 year old microwave. But. Anyway, we're gonna go for the hardcore bit uh, uh, fiddlers. This is the horror of memory banking. We got 12 bits. We have 2K read, uh, I'm sorry, 2K read, right? The rest of it's all fixed ROM today, we would call it. Anyway, you could only see, these are 128 bytes, and you could switch among the rest. You had 36K here, not 32 as a lot of people think, it was 36. You always see these two down here, and you can choose one other bank. Each bank, 128 words, Read, write, 1K, fixed. They called it fixed and erasable. And this goes on, I mean, the list goes on for 36K going down. And if you had memory or a program you wanted to transfer to, yeah, you had to do bank switching. Again, lots of your tax dollars, lots of therapy, they survived. How tight's your code? 
Okay. Come on, guys. We're all proud of some of the things we've done. We eked out that one little cycle out of it. We're planning missions to the moon. Guidance, navigation, control, landing, entry back on Earth. How big's your, uh, uh, how big are the uh, areas you allocate for memory? Remember, you're working with everything has to be two, fit in 2K. Flying to the moon, your main basic task, you had seven words. How tight's your code? Seven words, seven variables. A little less if you want to use double precision. Oh, and those virtual machines, you actually got a nice bigger area. It's about 40 words. Remember, there's no stack. They, in that VM, they implemented the stack. They had to implement index registers, step registers, et cetera, et cetera. All very cool. Never seen before in any other computer architecture. This is the VM that's running. Well, remember, you're running five VMs, 80,000 ins uh, instructions a second. Your code would really be better, better, better be pretty tight. In a day and age when the concept of interactive computing, think of that, 1960. I got my degree in the 70s with punch cards. Interactive was just coming into play. How do you interact? Here's your constraints. How do you interact with a computer? And no, no jokes about punch cards. Imagine someone typing seven Gs during launch, all the vibration, trying to talk, uh, type in those big gloves. <coughs> no, keyboards aren't going to work. How are you going to do an interface? Think of it in an aircraft. It's nothing but instruments, dials, gauges, switches. Where the heck are you going to put all that interface? Hmm? They came up with this absolutely brilliant. This is one of the greatest inventions of the 20th century. This is called the display and keyboard. This was your interface. This is all there was. There ain't no more. You had a little keyboard, display and keyboard. You had a display. It turns out, human factors designs, you know that if you're scanning an instrument panel, I used to be a pilot for 25 years. You know, you look, you grab a piece of information, grab a piece of information, grab another piece of information. You're going as quick as you can. Turns out the best a human can probably do at a glance is absorb three pieces of information, give or take. Wasn't it nice that lots of things in life are three numbers? Time, hours, minutes, seconds. Attitude, roll, pitch, yaw, three. Things nicely come in three. So we have three rows of data. But we still have to interact with the damn thing. Think of that. What kind of language, for lack of another word, would you use to interact with this computer that's flying you from the Earth to the moon? And no, we're not talking languages like Java or anything else. What is the language you'd use to make in your request? What kind of questions would you have? What kind of answers do you want back? That's a standard computer question. To give you an idea of how important an instrument is in an aircraft, spacecraft, or whatever is by its proximity to where your eyes are. That's human factors. Fly my airplane, main instrument is right there square, right where I'm going to look, which is my attitude indicator. I get tons of information from that right next to its altitude and airspeed. What direction? With those, you can do anything. You can fly blind, you can do whatever. Beautiful things. Here is the command module instrument panel. Boy, is that a mess. Thank goodness we got touch screens now, but we didn't then. The computer. Again, proximity of what's important. You have your two attitude indicators. What if one breaks? And you have the computer sitting there. Guess what they spend a lot of time looking at? Where all the information's coming from, going to. Gives you an idea of the sense of importance. The lunar spacecraft. If you ever get a chance, get to the cradle of aviation. It's out on Long Island. 
Garden City. I, I put together a couple of the exhibits when they opened. This is one of them. Here is the computer. Oh, and I forgot my, oh, props. Could someone grab me that box? Thank you, sir. Anyway, my apologies. In the lunar spacecraft, and I'm gonna apologize on this, I just found this last night, doing some cleanup around the house. Found a model I built 50 years ago. And there, ooh, well, there's a lot more that's breaking. Anyway, this is my little lunar module from when I was young. And this is what it looks like. Well, it had a few more legs and other parts. <laughs> but anyway, so you're standing up in this. And your nose is up against the window. Weight is the most important thing in aerospace. Certainly cost isn't. Anyway, you're standing up, your face is up against the window, and there are big windows. And so now you're standing up. How do you interface with the computer? You have the guy over here on the right sitting there reading it to you with your nose up against the window so you can see outside. And, the, and again, I've, 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 I've flown a couple of these. It is a beautiful thing. The computer is just right where your hand would naturally go. Just about every astronaut will tell you. You know how it's always amazing to watch people play piano and talk or do whatever, but they never look at their hands? I could never do that. I can't even type on a keyboard without looking. They say after a while, you just type it just because you know where your fingers are. Beautiful thing. Absolutely stunning. So that's in the lunar spacecraft. Two guys looking out the windows and just a little, little, little like that. But here is your problem. Pizza. What the heck are we talking about? Pizza's in the disky. If I came to the United States and I did not have a great command of the English language, I'm walking around New York City and I'm a little hungry. What's the staple of New York City? Pizza. All kinds of people languishing because the classic $1 slice no longer exists in New York. Bummer. There are lousy slices anyway. But if I go around and say, I, you know, if I, I, I want to get something to eat, I don't know English, I can get by with saying something like eat. Eat. You know, you find a cop, you go eat. Okay. Eat what? Pizza. Although grammatically horrific, it tells you everything that someone needs to communicate with that you're hungry and you want a pizza. It's a verb, eat, a noun, pizza. We can get into semantics and grammar and all the rest, but that's all you need to know to get yourself a slice of pizza. We do the exact same thing in computing. It hasn't changed since, well, any, well maybe a little after any yet. But we have the concept of an operation we want to do. We also have the concept of an operand. Run, program, doesn't matter if it's text or you double click. Well, what program? Well, how about Microsoft Word? How about Great American Novel as the operand? We've done this and we don't even think of it. We are eat pizza. Verb and a noun, beautiful thing. Now, that's exactly how you fly to the moon with the Apollo computer. Take a look at it, the most important keys. Verb and noun. Okay, you can all go home. You just learned everything you need to know. <laughs> Exam will be in about an hour. I hope you study hard. <laughs> everything was numeric. Again, imagine guys, big gloves, eight Gs, banging around in a spacecraft during launch. How well do you think that'll look trying to type? No, no. And you didn't have enough memory or you know, processing power to be able to do commands like we think of even with DOS. So, everything had numbers. Trust me, when you're a pilot, you want to cut things down to its minimum. I want to do a verb 16. What the heck is a verb 16? Display data. I had close to 100 verbs. Maybe about 80 of them, actually. Maybe about 100 nouns. Okay, display data. Well, what data, kid? How about the time my engine's going to fire? 
Always a good question to ask when you go into the moon. Right? You'd like to know. Verb 16, display data, noun 33, time of ignition, comes up hours, minutes, seconds. Again, you can go home, examine an hour. You just learned 80% of what you need to know to operate the computer. Oh, there's a few other buttons on there. You can clear data. Your hours, minutes, and seconds, or X, Y, and Z come up. Your verb is displayed here, your program, your noun. Also, what your main program is. Remember, you're running a whole bunch of them. We say, oh, program, lunar landing program. Well, there's a lot of other programs running in the background, but the major one that you're interested in comes up there. And again, near and dear to my heart, blinking lights. You got a little light that says the computer's busy. Gotta love that. Anyway, our IMU, inertial measurement unit. Remember, a computer is blind, deaf, and dumb unless it has data coming in and out. You could have the fanciest Intel inside sitting there on your desk and it's not going to do a lot. What do you want it to do? Well, I want to edit, a pro edit a, a, my program I'm working on. Well, you need data in and out. The IMU is one of those. It's a collection of accelerometers, how quick you're accelerating, integrated over time, that's your velocity. And it also maintains a rock steady orientation. Spacecraft rotates around it. It always knows what's considered a stable member. Gyros, all the rest, we're not going to go into all that. All that data is sent to the computer. Here's what it looks like. This is a miracle of modern engineering in 1960s. Absolutely, blindingly precise. Milli arc seconds of precision. Slow drift rates. <sighs> Took a lot of time in your tax dollars or your grandparents' tax dollars or something. But honestly, it's a, it was a miracle of modern engineering. <coughs> optics. <laughs> We're going to be playing a little bit with optics in ways you would never imagine. Anyway, so. Navigating in space. How the guys hundreds of years ago get around on the oceans? They used a sextant. They looked at the stars. Absolutely no different. The seafaring person of 400 years ago plopped into Apollo spacecraft, given a quick briefing on the sextant. Well, come, well, it would come pretty quick. Software took all the raw data, created the solutions. The equations can be messy, but you can understand them. Oh yeah, you need you know, a little bit more math than I had, but honestly, when I, could, uh, yeah, I literally wrote the book on the computer. If I can understand it, anyone can, trust me. But you establish your position, your attitude, everything by the stars. That actually, not this one specifically, but even on the space station, they have a traditional sextant to see how well it would work navigating. And it wasn't a crazy thing. Remember, navigation, all you need is a really accurate clock and a clear view of the sky. That was all figured out hundreds of years ago. We're not inventing anything new. Oh, we're refining the technology, but that's just like getting a new Intel chip. I mean, that's no biggie. And here it is in the spacecraft. Down by the astronaut's feet are the sextant and a small telescope. Only a government agency could spend millions of dollars on a one power telescope. <laughs> I don't make these decisions. This is before my time. Actually, what they use that is like a spotting scope for the sextant. But uh, yeah. A bazillion dollars for a one power telescope? I want to be the guy that wrote that contract. <laughs> Flying to the moon, this is the whole point of why you're here, I hope. We have to figure out three questions. Now at home I have a whole rack of books. All the equations, all the software, all the, all the. Sounds groovy. I'm old enough to use groovy in a sentence. 
But that's just the formal process. To understand how to fly to the moon, you only need three things to know. These are the good ones. Oh, the math gets a little involved, but it's not impossible. I mean, again, I can figure it out, so trust me. That was, it was a breakthrough, but it wasn't impossible. The three questions in space flight. Doesn't matter if it's the ISS, you're flying to Mars, Moon, or driving to New York, <laughs> which is outer space for some people, I'm sure. Okay, question. In space flight, ladies and gentlemen, which way is up? To the studio audience, which way is up in space? I wanted to talk, oh, way too much rock and roll when I was young, so I, I, it's just a little tough for me to hear. As one idea, yeah, there's problems with that, which we'll go into. Which way is up? The one you have said it is. <laughs> Any direction you want. But, but, key, key, I can't emphasize this enough. The key thing is, we have to establish a common frame of reference. Classic case in point. I'm standing at the North Pole. Which way is up? I'm standing at the South Pole. Which way is up? Houston, we got a problem. <laughs> we have the problem of we didn't agree completely on which way is up. Oh, it was up relative to gravity fields, blah, 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 blah. But I can't use that. So as long as we all decide this way is up, referenced by the stars, we're all good. As long as we all agree. Some knucklehead says it's over this way. Well, we're not going <laughs> to buy him a beer or anything. So yeah, we have to have a mechanism to do that. Better yet, Lel. Ready for some silly props? How do you figure out which way is up, navigating by the stars? Anyone want to take a guess? We got that fancy sexton. And that million dollar, one, one X uh, uh, telescope, help us. Well, yeah, now we get to use these. We fly by the stars. Okay, cool. We can all say North Star. Easy to decide on, good. Here's our little spacecraft. Michaels, they're, they're great to find these little <laughs> foam balls. Okay, we're gonna say that way is up. But I need a reference that's stable in three axes. I can rotate. That's my worry. I need to have something fixed in space. Yes, I got one vector, but I can rotate around that. I need something you know, that's fixed. So I take a sighting, North Star. It turns out there was 37 uh, uh, stars they had to choose from in Apollo. So anyway, now, Hey, we're getting smarter. We're going to take sightings on two stars. One up here, one up here. Now, we have two completely fixed things. And it's, uh, now I'm frozen like this. I mean, I can't twist and turn and have those sightings be correct. But I need to establish three axes also that orientation this way may not be the one I want. Could be the launch site, could be the landing site, could be you know, where you're splashing in the ocean. I need to be able to rotate that. But I have to be able to do that, just, uh, uh, you know, just a matrix transformation of which things. So I have a little more work to do. From the two sightings, yeah, now we have to crank up the uh, little bit of, uh, of algebra. I establish a plane. I now have a normal. Perpendicular. Hey, we're getting good at this. I now have a plane. Boom, now I'm in three axes. I start extending them, and yeah, falling apart. 
Now I have x, y, and z. Imagine that. And now I can rotate in any direction. Little mathematical transformation. Simple as that. You just learned how to program an inertial measurement unit. Give yourself a pat on the back. Yes, I'll accept beers afterwards. <laughs> Where am I? Another great question. Well, you're navigating by the stars. You don't have any other references. So, I want to navigate by the stars. Well, great. Stars aren't moving. I am. Where am I relative to what? Well, it turns out, again, we do all this fun stuff. We take a sighting on a star. We're interested where we are relative to the Earth or the Moon. I got my little moon. You take a sighting on a star also where the moon is. Calculate those angles. You know where you are in just a few little turns of the math. Work it out at home. You can do this. You have a good estimate where, where you are right now? Pretty much. You want to update that. They do all the magic. Yes, they even, it was one of the first applications of Kalman filtering, if you're familiar with that. Just invented a couple years prior to Apollo. And now, from that one reference as the Earth moves, that angle changes. Yes, you have to work it in three dimensions. You just learned that. Done. You're good. This is getting pretty easy, isn't it? you got to have the ball. Next question. Where the heck am I going? It's nice to know which way is up and where I am, but you need to figure out where the heck you're going. New York or Philly? VCF, doesn't matter what. So in order to know where I'm going, it helps to know how fast I am, what direction. That inertial measurement unit figured out all this stuff ahead of time. As you're firing the engine, it's collecting all the velocity information relative to what attitude you are. Done. Super. Equations of motion. Non-powered flight. If I throw a rock up, I can figure it out, physics 101, how far it's going to go, how high, and how fast. Oh yeah, now we have to figure it out in three dimensions, but that's whatever. That's just a complication. This flying in space is exactly like dead reckoning on the ocean or when you're flying in an airplane. No different. Again, the equations get a little more complex. That is it. Don't you feel like rocket scientists now? This is the local area, or actually where I, I, I flew out of a couple of these airports here for years with my uh, Cessna. This is a standard uh, aviation sectional map. If I want to go from central Jersey, which is Manville or something, over to Solberg, where they have the Bloom Festival, I just get a protractor, I draw a line, I calculate whatever. I know how fast I'm going or plan to fly. I know how high. I know all the parameters I need to know. And you go, that sounds like a little bit too much math. Actually, before the Second War, they had a great way to help figure all this stuff out. Now I need to do time, speed, distance. I need to adjust for the winds. I need all sorts of stuff, magnetic variation, et cetera. They came up with a brilliant little thing. The E6B. This has been around since before the, first, the Second War. This does all your calculations for you. Generations of pilots use this until now some smarty pants decided to put it into a calculator with fancy buttons. Time, speed, distance, fuel flow, all the stuff I need to know. This is a beautiful thing. Most people would recognize it as a circular slide rule with lots of little notations on there. I do my wind corrections. I do my density altitudes. I do whatever. Everything on this, been around for almost 100 years. Not only is this one of the most beautiful little analog instruments on Earth. I still use it, you know, well, I don't fly anymore because, but, you know, I'd feel more comfortable with this than I do a calculator. 
No batteries to wear out, right? We have photographic evidence. Photographic evidence of the, of the durability and the wonderful, oh, foreverness of this little device calculating, getting from point A to point B. We have photographic evidence from the 23rd century. True fact. What, yeah, bold statement, you want bold proof? There it is. <laughs> right there. Turns out Gene Roddenberry was a pilot in the Second War. That's his, his E6B. Great piece of trivia. If you learned anything, you just learned that. So, in the 23rd century, all the tools you need to fly from the Earth to the Moon are all there. We're getting low on time. We have about 15 minutes. Again, I'm certain you have zillions of questions. We'll just con you know, convene you know, uh, outside all the rest because we can talk for hours after this. Anyway, think of the infinite in probability. We all know where that came from. <laughs> infinite in probability of you being in the lunar module while they're landing and the pilot dies. What are you going to do? Right? Well, your moment of glory has come up. It's like every pilot on Earth wants to have the guy flying the jetliner drop over dead so he can you know, hop in and do it himself. <laughs> right? Yeah. Right? Anyone in the pilot here? Yes. Yes. You don't have to say it out loud. This is a private thought. Anyway, landing on the moon. You need to know this if you're going to hop and push the dead guy out of the way and take over and have your moment of glory. We have three phases in our landing. Braking, you got to slow down. You're going about eh, 1,800, close to 2,000 miles an hour. Hitting the ground at that speed is not advised. <laughs> so we have to slow down. We'll see why that makes it a little tough. Like if you want to see where you're going. I don't know about you, I really like seeing the runway when I land. Again, highly advisable. Today they have you know, magic, but I advise it. So you have to approach, you get slowed down, now you get a chance to look at the landing site. That's only about a oh, minute and a half, close to two minutes. You gotta make all your decisions. Am I where I'm supposed to be? Holy cow, oh geez, there's that rock. And then finally, you start descending vertically. You found a spot, now it's just, just like a helicopter. You fly the lunar module just like a helicopter, sort of. Settle it down, mankind is, you know, never the same again. Little schematic. The first part is that you want, first off, it turns out, again, that's a slow computer, to do all the calculations and all the rest. It takes about 15, 20 minutes for the computer to come up with all the numbers, so this is the pre-ignition. You start braking. We're you're trying to slow yourself against gravity. And so, and, and your velocity vector. Doesn't do much good if you're doing this or this. You have to go against, most efficiently, velocity. The only problem is you're facing straight up. Even if you're facing straight down, it wouldn't make much of a difference. You're not seeing much, you're you know, about maybe eight, 10 miles up. So, you want to slow down as quickly and efficiently as you can. So you're flying like this. Finally, you get down to a point where you can pitch over a little bit. Now you can see where the heck you ended up. That's a good thing. You want to see if there's your runway there, right? But just because you got to be efficient, there isn't a lot of fuel, you only get one chance at this, or you abort. Not allowed, well, it's allowed, but you don't want to do that. And then finally, once you find your little spot, hopefully you have the other legs on here, boom, down you go. That infinitely improbable thing, okay, as a passive observer, you can just sit back and watch all the magic happen. We're going to learn how to do this. This is the disky. This is years old, poorly done, yes, flog me. Guilty, that's my artwork. Yes, shame, shame. 
But anyway, so you, you, we talked about all those fancy numbers and all the rest that come up. Here's what they all mean. Programs number 63, lunar landing, braking phase. Program 63 comes up as major mode. Yes, there's a bunch of other programs running. Checking your attitude, checking this, you know, doing the digital autopilot magic. Three numbers come up. Your velocity, time to ignition. Here we have three seconds to go. And how much braking you've done today. This is three seconds before. Even before computers were nice and interactive, you know, you say delete a file or, you know, run something. You always want the, are you sure? And so five seconds before ignition, verb 99. Yeah, it's one of those fancy verbs. It says, are you sure? And if you are, you just hit the key called proceed. It says, yes, sir, thank you, sir. Ignition. You're on your way down. Now, you're sitting there looking up at the sky. Yeah, this engine going. So far, everyone says things are good. How do you know inside? You're sitting in a cockpit. It's driving itself. How do you know you're doing okay? Well, it turns out, and this is all over spacecraft. Everything from Gemini, Apollo, the shuttle, all of them, space day. You have a cheat sheet. And it's a little card, piece of cardboard, literally stuck up with Velcro. And every few moments, every 30 seconds in this case, it, it has on there what angle you're supposed to be at, what altitude you should be at, you know, what, how fast you're going down, et cetera, et cetera, the throttle settings, et cetera, all the, all the good numbers. And at uh, three minutes, you should be 30, I'll say 4,000 feet a second, you should be 87 degrees, your antenna should be this, and that's what those guys are doing, <coughs> cross-checking everything, because they can't see anything. Oh, the ground could say, oh, you're doing great, yeah. Do you trust the ground? No. Yeah, it's like trusting, well, whatever. So anyway, this is all for that first braking phase. And all you're doing is just checking. And now, uh, yeah. So now, it's time to pitch over and actually see where the heck we are. We're all fancy, dancy, comfortable with the idea of those head-up displays we see in all the flight simulators and all the numbers. Do you think they had that in 1966? No. They didn't have that until the 80s. That was pipe dream. So how do you know you're sitting there just looking through a window where the heck you're going? You have no sense of percent, no depth perception. Remember, there's no atmosphere even to give you cues about how far something is. So. How do you know where you're, where you're heading toward? <laughs> These guys are so clever. They were smart on this one. Go back to this in a sec. On the commander's window, left-hand window, double pane glass, etched in there are a bunch of angles. Slightly offset. The computer comes up. I got 10 minutes, so we're right on. Computer comes up and says, okay, you got 56 seconds until you we got to you know, finish up. Or, and I'm sorry, and you're heading toward the landing site 52 degrees. And you look through your window, line up 52 on the little indexes. On the window, that's where you're headed. Doesn't cost an ounce of weight. Cleverest thing ever. Just a little bit of perspective. Try to design something more simpler than that. You just sit there and you listen to the uh, audio from the moon landings. They pitch over and the first thing the guy says, 23 degrees or whatever. And the guy driving is sitting there going, got it. Okay, and every few seconds and every Cockpit had a different dynamic. Some people wanted it every certain amount of time. Some wanted just a steady stream of numbers. 
You wonder what the second guy in the cockpit does? Altitude, altitude rate, how fast, you know, how, how you are, how quickly you're coming down, and where you're heading. And the guy's sitting there just eyeballing the numbers. It is that simple on paper. You, tr you try it. <laughs> Infinitely improbable, but okay, now we think we found a good spot. Problem is, the moon's a tad dusty, very dusty. A couple of the astronauts couldn't see for the last 50, 100 feet. That's not a great way to spend your day. I haven't, I've never landed in zero, zero conditions. Jetliners today can. It's called a Cat 3A landing or 3B. It's eye-watering. You're sitting there, and you can't see a friggin' thing, and then all of a sudden there's a landing, and you hear the thump. Black magic. Totally black magic. So you have a couple things to help you. Okay, program 66, you're monitoring, you know, whatever, terminal descent. How fast you're going forward? Oh, by the way, what are the things you notice on these displays? Don't really notice it until you think about it. No decimal point. No decimal point. So that's not 312, that's 31.2. How do you know that? Because you're an astronaut. You can figure this out. You're a smart boy. <laughs> Same thing, altitude rate, altitude is, you know, whole numbers, blah, blah, blah. You also have, again, that important pile of instruments in front of you. This is your attitude. Okay, familiar with those maybe. This is what they call the cross pointers. Imagine this, yeah. You want to know, if you can't see the ground, you want to be coming straight down that last little bit, right? You don't want to be skidding across or break a leg or something. So that tells you, relatively speaking, right, left, forward, back. You hear a lot of that. Very last moments. Buzz Aldrin was famous. You know, four forward, four forward, four feet a second going forward. Able to see drifting fly. They couldn't see the landing site. Apollo 15 says, I might as well just close my eyes. He just brought his head inside the cockpit. Altitude, altitude rate, all the other stuff. You keep your eye on that, it'll get you, you, know, get you down. No problems at all. And now, we're on the moon. Congratulations. Buy me a beer. Anyway, we have six minutes. I'm done with this. Quickie questions. And again, I know we have to clean up and get the heck out of here. But uh, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, when we run out of time here, we'll just go and uh, uh, go outside. Sir. Yes, all right, yeah, you, how about, yeah. Um, how much manual control did the uh, pilot ah, Great question. No, exactly the one. Until you pitch over and see the landing site for the very first time, you're just sitting back drinking a beer and, you know, watching the world go by or the moon go by. You're not flying. Computer's flying for you. When you pitch over and the guy says 48 degrees and you look at it and go, oh, geez, that's not good. At that time, the attitude controllers are set up in unique ways. If I want to stretch yourself out, or come back, or right, or left, rather than changing your attitude, you give it a tap this way, or this way, or whatever, and that will bring your landing site a little closer, further away, and all the rest. You're not touching anything aside from that. Finally, when it comes time to do that final descent, they say, taking manual control. No, you're not. Please get it out of your mind. Just like flying an Airbus or you know, 787 or whatever, you're not flying an airplane. You're flying a computer. The computer's flying the plane. <laughs> Remember, it's all digital autopilot. Oh, they could break, up, break out and say, do it all manual, but honestly, really? No. All those inputs are taken, interpreted by the computer based on, based on, based on, moments of inertia, all that fun stuff. And that's how you maneuver around. That's how it does it for you. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I noticed that uh, some of the, like, some of the, the programs just think automatically. How would they name these different programs? Verb 37, change program. Enter. Program number, 63. Enter. Comes right on up. One of the verbs. Again, a verb. 
action to be done. What action? I want to put it in, I want to fire up a new program. Program 52, guidance navigation update, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, sir, in the back. Ah! <laughs> okay, okay. All right, you started me. This is, this is his fault. If we run late, this is all your fault. All right, I hope you feel bad, too. Again, years of therapy. Okay. Apollo 11, 1201, 1202 alarms. What the heck are those? Remember how I said, and this, I'm, this is really condensed. We can talk details later. This is your only, these are both your process table entries and your scratch memory. Here you have your priority, here you have all your virtual machine stuff, uh, program counters, what banks you're using, blah, blah, blah. The idea was we're never going to run out of these. We only have a few. And boy, did they sweat making certain they had enough. Okay. We had a problem. No, get it out of your mind. We, it wasn't the wrong switch position. It wasn't fill in the blank of all the nonsense you heard. The answer is a lot hairier than that. A combination of a badly terminated radar input to the digital analog computer, or digital analog converter to the computer, combined with two power supplies, spec'd out correctly and correctly implemented to be locked in phase. Okay, but not phase locked, whoops. It turned out a combination of all of those caused what today we would call, they didn't call it, but today we would call it a hot IO. Remember all those 150 devices that you could control? Many of them updated with just a bit of, just a moment, processor stop, direct memory access IO. I got to change a word, keep on going, guys. Turns out they had a hot I.O. Landing on the moon, you're running 85% processor capacity. Non-stop I.O. was about 15%. Now, all of a sudden, you can't complete your work. Whole concept of dispatching was you fire it up, quick program, last thing you do before you terminate, and they only lasted fractions of seconds was reschedule yourself again, let other work go and grab all that memory. But now I've saturated my CPU. I can't complete. I filled up all my vacant er my, my vague areas and my core sets, my VM blocks and my uh, uh, just regular task blocks. Guess what a 1202 alarm is, first one that they had? No more vacant areas, no more virtual machine blocks. They hadn't finished. 1201, figure it out. No more core sets. They were just running out of time. They were actually operating just a hair under this, under that 100% CPU. But then Buzz Aldrin goes, obviously he didn't know this. Buzz Aldrin goes, oh, I want to find out whatever was one of those verb nouns. Click, 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 click. And that threw it over the limit. And he didn't know it at the time. He actually correctly diagnosed it as, oh, every time I try doing A, B, and C, I get an alarm. You know, it's like the doctor. You go into the doctor and you say, oh, my arm hurts every time I do this. Yeah, well, don't do that. And that's what, <laughs> right? Yeah. So anyway, that was it. Oh, and I got 15 seconds. One quick one, and then honestly, I'm going to pack up because we have someone coming in after this. More than happy to chat with you while I'm doing that. But one last one real quick. Sir. Did the um, astronauts actually have to memorize all the nouns and verbs? Or was there a <laughs> on the you asked for that. Okay. A little protective cover. That's your list of verbs and nouns. And yes, after you've been training for years, if you don't have them committed to memory, well, that's silly. I mean, you would know that. You know, it's like you know, someone that does uh, 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 geography and hasn't figured out the names of the major towns in your state. You know, you know these things just by repetition. <sighs> I did it. I made it on time. I'm going to clean up.